Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday, presented by Juniper Networks. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts, tracking down threats and vulnerabilities, and solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. And now a word about our sponsor, Juniper Networks. Organizations are constantly evolving and increasingly turning to multi-cloud to transform IT. Juniper's connected security gives organizations the ability to safeguard users, applications, and infrastructure by extending security to all points of connection across the network. Helping defend you against advanced threats, Juniper's connected security is also open so you can build on the security solutions and infrastructure you already have. Secure your entire business from your endpoints to your edge and every cloud in between with Juniper's connected security. Connect with Juniper on Twitter or Facebook. And we thank Juniper for making it possible to bring you Research Saturday. And thanks also to our sponsor, Envail, whose revolutionary zero-reveal solution closes the last gap in data security, protecting data in use. It's the industry's first and only scalable commercial solution, enabling data to remain encrypted throughout the entire processing life cycle. Imagine being able to analyze, search, and perform calculations on sensitive data, all without ever decrypting anything, all without the risks of theft or inadvertent exposure. What was once only theoretical is now possible with Envail. Learn more at Envail.com. We've been tracking Lazarus Group, or the group known to be operating under the umbrella, I guess, named Lazarus. That's Vitaly Kremez. He's director of research at Flashpoint. The research we're discussing today is titled, Disclosure of Chilean Red Bank Intrusion Leads to Lazarus Ties. They are known for one of the most sophisticated, financially motivated hacks we've seen in the past, linked to, of course, the bank, the bank heist, and many, many others. So they're continuously being targeting various financial institutions, and they consider to be one of the most formidable groups that did doing that. So, and we've been tracking them, and through our tracking, of course, collaboration with the researchers, everything we can find about this group is very interesting to us. Because their primary goal, of course, uh, actually the group has multiple goals, but one of the goals is to bring cash or the money back to the economy of North Korea. So they're very unique in the way they're positioned, and plus they're very agile and they're very active. So that almost always heightens our interest related to this group and what they've been working on. So while we've been tracking, we identified one simple called Power Tangba, which is a PowerShell toolkit. And then while we were looking deeper, of course, and then the, the open source reporting came out saying that the Red Bank suffered a breach and they connected to one of the malware, which they didn't identify. We found the traces of Lazarus. And this, of course, raised lots of interest and lots of attention from our clients and, and both the industry-wide. Well, let's walk through what you found here. Uh, this one starts with kind of an interesting initial attack vector. Can you describe to us what happened? Sure. The attack vector is indeed very, very interesting. It's essentially what would been reported, actually, and what been semi-confirmed by the Red Bank as well, that the uh, developer who is an employee working for Red Bank, essentially, was approached by someone on LinkedIn, essentially, on social media, uh, offering a job. And then once they go into the job interview process, and essentially even had an interview over Skype in Spanish, which is very, very interesting, they established a kind of trust relationship which oftentimes really helps the malicious actors or the nation state groups to really deliver the payloads where they need to be. And then uh, through that relationship, the uh, employee received a payload, which is essentially was application PDF, which is a kind of like binary executable, which had a covert function. So this, this was not only uh, kind of a fake application, but it had also a purpose to essentially download and install Power Tangba, which was the reconnaissance tools used by the Lazarus group. From, from our experience, you know, like when we look at the groups such as the Lazarus or Fin7, they also rely heavily actually on building this relationship and using this targeted approach, which allows them to be more successful with their payloads. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one because, uh, you know, like you said, it, it started with social engineering, but also interesting, I, I guess, a, a lesson for us all that I guess this employee was responding to a job offer on his work computer. Indeed. There's a lot of lessons to learn here, lessons to learn how sophisticated and resourceful the group is and how targeted their approach can be. 
have been crossing, like you said, into the social engineering realm, but also how the employees should not probably use the social media while they're at work or uh, download additional tools while they're employed by any company. So it's, yet again, it highlights both the attack vector as the uh, possible employee who can be browsing social media and being approached by the groups, but also highlights the possible like strategies, how we can think about network hygiene of applying maybe defenses and looking deeper into social media relationships or the access the employees might have, because that's yet again, open the doors for that intrusion. Yeah. And that social engineering angle, I mean, these folks did their homework to go through the ruse of a a job interview enough that they gained this person's trust and got them to download the payload. Indeed. Indeed. And it's very interesting if if you also take into account that the group had North, North Korean affiliation. So that means that they have more resources and linguistic expertise at their disposal, too. Definitely, that's one of the most, that's what makes this group very, very interesting. Not necessarily even the biggest hacks they've had, but also, for example, their abilities to social engineer or abilities to essentially have access to sophisticated payment methods or move money across the chains like they were looking into from the bank of the bank heist. So that's what makes this group unique and so interesting. So this person thinks that he's applying for a job and he downloads this file that that he thinks is going to be part of that process. What happens next? They download a file and the file is essentially called application ppdf.exe. So they execute and then they've been asked to execute essentially the document, uh, which is essentially not a document, which is an executable but the executable itself is essentially it's a .NET application which contains a covert function inside of it. One of the functions is called essentially threat procedure that essentially decodes the base64 encoded values and executes essentially and calls the server covertly while you launch this application. So it does its own function while the application is opened. It actually it acts as a load downloader of additional malware toolkit. So, yeah, it has a second meaning beyond just the application process. So, without knowing, the employee was running essentially the tool that it would download the additional power time by toolkits. So, that's essentially what it was doing in the background. To the person who downloaded this and executed the file, but this still looked like it was part of a job application process. Indeed. Whenever you launch this application, it looks like a pretty simple one where essentially you would list your credentials, you would list for the job you're interested, the salary, desired salary, et cetera. So it does look like a legitimate application. Actually, they even mimic the legitimate company called Global Processing Center, LTD, which is, of course, not uh, not the real company that's used by Lazarus. But there's a company that exists that provides software related to that. So they did their reconnaissance and they tried to essentially stay off the radar and try not to be detected by mimicking legitimate tools and uh, behaviors that they observed in the past from other employees. So yes, they did their homework. This user is looking at this fake job application, and meanwhile, in the background, this Power Ratankpa payload gets downloaded. And so what is it up to behind the scenes? What's interesting, in fact, when the report actually came out, they noted that the malware that they discovered, which they didn't say actually publicly, or you know, they're, it's left to open to interpretation, but it contained multiple layers of PowerShell code. And they said it, the malware they discovered was not detected by any antivirus engines or solutions they've had. And one of the interesting things, how the criminals, or how, rather the nation state actors, they've been bypassing that. they by bypassing but in layers of PowerShell encoded code. So what happened is it actually downloaded an intermediary code, which the only function of this intermediary code would be to translate, to decrypt the second stage code using Base64, Regendale, and Shata56, walking through that, use the function crypt to do, essentially decrypting the power tongue and executing that. And one of the interesting things we've seen is as the groups move towards scripting language malware, more like high language programming malware, it's actually defeats certain antivirus detection. That's been a known fact, because specifically with PowerShell and, of course, the JavaScript type of uh, loaders, because it's so much harder to fingerprint and signature them, and it's so easily easy to obfuscate the meaning of them. And then once essentially they decoded that, they unwrapped the whole power tango, actually version B, as detailed by our colleagues at Proofpoint. And one of the interesting in- insights about that version that was actually communicating on HTTPS, which was probably a new invention since the PowerProofPoint report, 
And we saw clearly that it resembles our tongue brain memory, and it was starting collecting information about the machine and sending information elsewhere. So that's what we've been observing and detailed in our report. And so what does it seem to be after here? So here, essentially, what the script is doing, essentially doing a very in-depth, I would say, reconnaissance about the machines where the malware was executed. So the, essentially, it collects all the information about what the computer information is. So it runs the certain scripts, and Windows Management Instrumentation script collects the computer name, collects Windows architecture, languages of the system, service packs, even collects the file shares. For example, it hunts, it hunts down for SMB mapped folders, RDPs, of course, checks for if RDP is open, checks different ports, so obtains also the proxy setting, obtains the user information, obtains the processes. And the idea for, for the group is to profile machines so well, so they avoid targeting, for example, researchers or anyone else, and they can handpick their targets based on their supposed results. So, for example, once they have a very, you know, kind of good target with the bank information, when they can look at their logs and they can see that this specific machine is, has multiple, like, file shares available, it makes sense they're inside the bank. They will start executing and pushing towards the additional payload. And, and of course, another thing what the script is doing is, very importantly, it actually checks the privileges. It checks what the malware privileges are are they operating under. And do they actually need to, uh, for example, or other, can they create a service as a, for persistency? So they're looking for methods for persistency, and if we're looking for methods for reconnaissance about the victims. And the idea for that is once they collect all the information, send it to the server, they will start moving towards the next stage, which is likely additional malware toolkit or additional payload they would use for to covertly watch the environment longer and look for the methods how they can cash out. And we've seen as a group that they've been pursuing ATM networks with the fast cash operation, for example, as detailed by US CERT, where they've been actually watching slowly and looking into how the banks process SWIFT payments, for example, as it was a big topic for our discussion we've had in the past. So they've been actually they're gonna be next stage would be for them to watch them silently for maybe a week or two before they start moving deeper. This is a significant dwell time between how the sophisticated group operates. And it's lucky that actually Red Bank was able to catch them earlier. And so how were they caught? How did Red Bank discover that they were in their network? Actually, this remains to be one of the mysteries. So we don't entirely know how they've been discovered. Hmm. In many cases, the group's been discovered at, at the point of cash out when the banks identify suspicious transaction, go to the bank network or or compromised ATM devices here, appears to be actually the bank was able to fully minimize the intrusion, potential intrusion of this attack. It's not really clear, and we actually don't have evidence to truly know that, but it seems like they were able to do so. Sometimes, actually, this group has been caught, I, based on my experience I've seen, is on the point of lateral movement. So, for example, if, if they start moving too fast across the network and the very uh, proficient or effective network hunters catch them on that level and they uh, stop them and essentially eradicate the attack, that's what been their point of weakness. But here it's yet to be determined. We don't fully know that as of now. So uh, all signs point to this uh, being the Lazarus group. Can you describe to us uh, what do we know about Lazarus and, and why in this case do we uh, point in their direction? So first of all, Lazarus has so many different names. It's also called Lazarus Group, Hidden Cobra, Kimsuki. It's an, it's an APT group, essentially, Advanced Persistent Threat Group, it's come with, with, which is alleged to comprise of operators from Bureau 121, which was the Cyber Warfare Division of North Korea's military. And the group has been active since 2009. And actually, one of the interesting things, as I mentioned earlier, that the group's not only interested in actually in some potential like politically motivated attacks, but also pursuing and exploiting financial institutions. It's one of the most formidable in that arena. What makes them essentially so unique, and it's also they also help heavily target Latin American financial institutions, and they've been doing that in the past, specifically in Chile, actually. And uh, here, the connection to the Lazarus group, Lazarus group is made through their Power Tangba Toolkit, which is a very unique PowerShell tool that's attributed to them since 2017. What's interesting thing is, We've seen with the Lazarus group, the evolution. So in 2016, they used the toolkit identified as Ratangba by researchers, I think initially by Trend Micro. Ratangba was a toolkit they used, which is essentially a binary tool compiled on a Windows system, essentially used uh, and contained very similar arguments that the Power Tangba has, but it was more of a static, I guess, 
and didn't contain the scripting language advantages that the Power Tongue Bar has. But we've seen with the public reporting, with the news and the attention that the, the group achieves or obtains through researchers and news and media coverage, it's actually adopted the Power Tongue Bar to, towards PowerShell. So it has their unique structures, their unique URL patterns, their unique code that's only unique to the, the uh, Lazarus group we've seen and no one else as far as we know. So that's why it makes it actually quite interesting for us. The unique targeting of financial institution coupled with sophisticated attacks and uh, unique technical code overlap. Essentially, in our blog, is we detail the very unique code overlaps with the Power Tango, which makes the connection apparent and evident from the technical perspective. And so what are your recommendations for folks to protect themselves against this? What steps should they take? That's a very good question. So when, when this group essentially targets the banks or targets individuals, they usually have done lots of reconnaissance or they actually have lots of resources to do that. And oftentimes, you know, whatever defenses we might have, they, they were able to employ certain you know, uh, measures or, or, or essentially tools to bypass them. What interesting here is that, as we discussed earlier, the social engineering component. So whenever we think about the attacks like Lazarus, we oftentimes think about very sophisticated malware intrusion where we don't know what was the initial attack vector. Here, we're lucky to have actually reported this uh, social engineering attack vector. So monitoring employees who might have access to social media specifically at work, specifically who can go to LinkedIn or essentially, or, you know, for example, Skype and uh, use it for professional network rather than for business purposes, it might be a possible flag to investigate. And essentially, one interesting thing is how you can defend against those attacks is, of course, looking into, I'm a huge fan of the attack framework. The attack framework was based on essentially well before it had on the cyber kill chain. So look into the vulnerabilities that the company or my cap towards the social engineering trusted relationship aspect. And essentially testing this, mapping up the attack as we detailed and we provided in our blog, reviewing how would the company posture might be across this chain. For example, how likely it is if the employee from Bank XYZ gets reached out by somebody who is trying to recruit and essentially deploys a toolkit known to be a Lazarus one. So that's one. But of course, on a technical level, on a very tactical one, monitoring for indicators of compromise, deploying the ER signatures across the network environment, monitoring for suspicious for oddities, essentially, looking for the hackers or attackers moving towards the ATM environment, uh, swift gateways, looking for unauthorized or irregular activity in, in those areas. But here, the added twist is that we should be also looking to social media as the potential attack vector for that to unfold. So there's a lot of lots of lessons to be learned here, actually, and specifically on the social engineering aspect and how employee can be essentially accelerators or essentially unwitting helpers to this group to install their payload. Yeah, it's certainly an interesting one, and I suppose it also points to the fact that you can't underestimate groups like this in terms of the resources that they bring to bear to get at what they want. Indeed, indeed. You can never under underestimate Lazarus. As it's really one of the most formidable APT groups we had seen lately in the past, and we we can probably we assess with moderate confidence that they will continuously be that one of the most formidable groups in future. So yes, we should never underestimate, especially the actors or the attackers who have so many resources and so much backing from the government. Yeah, I suppose also there's this educational and training component with your employees to face the reality and say, listen, if you're if you're looking around for other opportunities, well, please uh, do us a favor and do that on your personal machine. Indeed, indeed. Definitely don't do it on the, on the corporate machine or environment and isolate actually those machines from from being, you know, available to even to social media and Skypes and other. So yeah, definitely there's education component in those leadership in that as well that might actually be the force catalyst for future maybe possible positive changes in that area. Yeah. For security. So since you all published uh, this particular bit of research, there's been some additional information that's come along. Yes, indeed. Uh, actually, there's a company that followed up on our intelligence report and our research called Question Intelligence Operations Team. They also uncovered potentially that the Pakistani financial service providers and its employee was also targeted by the same malware and the same attack chain, just like the Lazarus one targeted Chilean. And actually, they detailed in their blog 
And essentially, it points out that the potential that this group was targeting uh, in two different fronts, or two different directions. While they also were in Chile pursuing Red Bank intrusion, they also were targeting Pakistani financial institutions, which also kind of makes sense since they've been very active in both the Asian and Latin American space. One of the interesting things there also to note that actually Pakistan previously and the Islamic Bank previously reported a suspicious ATM activities or uh, irregularities potentially with a big heist. And we couldn't figure out back then what was the essentially the reasoning behind that or what was the possible explanations of that. So that m- report might also fill some of those gaps related to the cash out. It's still yet unconfirmed, but yet again, there's a possible evidence of the uh, group also operating in Pakistan as of, of the latest report. So something to keep track of. Yeah, another piece of the puzzle. And, you know, nice that you all reach out to each other and, and share your finding uh, from organization to organization. Indeed. To truly defeat those threats, it's important for us to collaborate and share intelligence because they collaborate and share intelligence how to target us, and we should be collaborating and share intelligence how to protect against them. So it's imperative in our industry at this age. Our thanks to Vitaly Kremez from Flashpoint for joining us. The research is titled Disclosure of Chilean Red Bank Intrusion Leads to Lazarus Ties. We'll have a link in the show notes. Thanks to Juniper Networks for sponsoring our show. You can learn more at juniper.net slash security or connect with them on Twitter or Facebook. And thanks to Envale for their sponsorship. You can find out how they're closing the last gap in data security at envale.com. The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. The coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben, editor is John Petrick, technical editor is Chris Russell, executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.